Dear Lord, I pray that you continue to bestow wisdom upon this church body. I pray that you keep us humble, Lord, and don't let me get in the way of your message. I pray that you prepare our hearts to receive the message that you have for us tonight. Um, and above all, I pray that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've officially finished Genesis, and we're entering into the book of Exodus. Uh, the name Exodus comes from the Septuagint Greek. It means to exit, or it means departure. If you were to read this from a Hebrew Bible, it's titled, And These Are the Names. So the meaning in Hebrew of the book, that word, is, And These Are the Names. Uh, I personally think that the Gentiles chose a better name with Exodus. Um, I, in fact, I named my son Exodus because I like the name so much, and also because of the meaning behind it all. You, know, you have the underlying theme in the book of Exodus is deliverance. Um, God's chosen people are delivered out of slavery in Egypt and into a barren wasteland, but on their way to the promised land. And it's a struggle for them, but God provides. And I love that theme. Um, why I chose it for my son's name. Uh, and we can't forget this all happens because Joseph settles there in the land of Egypt. Um, they never go back home after the events in Genesis. And around 400 years go by of the Jewish people being idle in, in Egypt, a land that God did not intend for them to settle in. Exodus chapters 1 through 12 are basically Egypt's domination over the Jews. Let's read Exodus 1. Uh, six. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So we're dealing with a completely new group of Jews and Egyptians. Everyone we read about in Genesis is long dead. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, labor and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. So this pharaoh never even met Joseph, and the things Joseph did for the last pharaoh mean nothing to him. But his plan of preventing the Jews from becoming more numerous failed, obviously. There's about two million Jews at this time in Egypt. Um, it's an estimate, of course, but we get this idea from Exodus 12:37. We can get that on the screen. The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, there are about 600,000 men on foot, besides the women and children. So if you have 600,000 men, you get around 2 million Jews at that time. And that's a pretty large number, and it's no wonder the Pharaoh was afraid. Eventually, though, he decides overworking them is not enough, and decrees that every Hebrew son born be cast in the Nile River. So we're seeing sin in the Bible grow and increase in the world further. Now we're seeing for the first time in the Bible, government instituted genocide, right? Back in, in the beginning of Genesis, you have Cain murdering Abel. Now it's a whole people being, you know, a whole people, all their sons being wiped out. It's just the way that sin grows in our world. Um, while this is taking place, God focuses our attention in chapter 2 to one family, the parents of Moses. Exodus 2.2. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. This makes me smirk a little bit because the author is saying baby Moses was, was very beautiful. And, and you know who wrote the book, right, of Exodus? Moses did. Uh, pretty funny. But we all know what happens here. Moses' mother puts him in a basket, sends him down the river. At the same time, the Pharaoh's daughter goes down to the Nile River to bathe. Uh, she, need, she sees the basket, opens it up, and sees a baby boy crying, and she feels sorry for him and decides to raise him. She names him Moses. 
she says, because she drew him out of the water. Moses means to draw out, and there's a lot of drawing out in this book, just like with deliverance being the theme, drawing out is part of that, and it's part of Moses' life as well, not just being drawn out of the river, but being drawn out of Egypt, along with the Jewish people. So Pharaoh's daughter adopts him, uh, and a little awesome note is she actually hires Moses' mother to wean him and pays her for it during this time while he's being brought up. <clears throat> and after Moses is fully grown, it, it kind of skips forward a little bit in the scripture to him seeing an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And he knows he's a Hebrew. Um, so let's, let's read in Exodus 2, verse 12. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw that there was no one around, he struck and killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. Notice how Moses looked around. The scripture specifically says that to see if he would be caught. He thought he could get away with murder here. If he had looked around and saw other Egyptians there, he wouldn't have done it. Now back then, if you saw someone beating on one of your own people, it's by extension beating on your own family, your own family member. Whether Moses accidentally killed him or purposefully doesn't matter to me. Either way, what he did was wrong. He looked around to see whether anyone was watching. He should have been looking up, figuratively, you know. Um, and since no one around was there, he allowed himself to be consumed by his wrath to the point of using lethal force. <clears throat> and it's not as if those are the only two options. Do nothing or kill him, right? I come across too many instances where people think, we have to choose between the opposite sides of a spectrum, between two extremes. At work, I'll tell someone not to be rude to the residents that are living there at the apartment complex. And sometimes my worker will say, oh, what do you want me to do, be fake? It's like, no, I'm not asking you to be fake, and I, and I don't want you to be rude. There's an in-between, you know. Um, just be a decent person. Treat others with respect. But back to Moses. Are the only two options let someone be beaten to death? or kill the one beating him? No, of course not. This, that's a false dichotomy. You can intervene and still have a righteous anger that doesn't consume you to the point of killing a man. This is why we pray for wisdom, and this is why we pray for discernment. I don't know if any of you have heard of this before, but I've had multiple people in my past tell me when they get into fights, they kind of black out until the fight's over. They, they don't remember actually hitting the person or, or beating them up and they're fully awake but it's not till after and they kind of come to that you know they they see what happened um, I don't still hang out with those people you know um, just a side note but anyway there's no other explanation for it other than their complete submission to their wrath takes over when we're not slaves to Christ we are slaves to our sin this doesn't just apply to wrath. It applies to all sins. You know, who are you when nobody is around to see you? What are you giving yourself over to? <clears throat> are you allowing sins a foothold in your life? It could be lusts when you're alone. It could be gluttony. It could be slothfulness. Uh, let's not forget how sin manifests and grows inside you if you allow it. And if you think you're getting away with it or it's not affecting you, you're dead wrong. And that's the pun and that pun's intended. You're, you know, you're, you'll both end up physically dead and spiritually dead. Let's read on. Now he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And Moses said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Did you intend to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. Moses becomes so afraid because if his people knew, the Pharaoh was about to know if he didn't already. So he flees the land of Midian. He flees to the land of Midian, sorry. There he meets and marries Zipporah, and he has a son by the name of Gershon. During this time, the king of Egypt there dies, um, the one that Moses fled from, and God takes pity on his people. He sees their plight and their slavery. And it's here in chapter 3, verse 2, we see God appearing to Moses. 
Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not being consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burning up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am your God, your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. There's a couple things I want to point out here. Again, we see at the beginning of that passage, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire. And it's God speaking to him. So you're seeing another hint at the triune God that we worship. And also, we see God using the phrase that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I don't really see too many people expounding upon that uh, as explaining, we just went through those three patriarchs, but why is it a phrase at all? What, what's the significance of it? Why isn't God just saying he's the God of Abraham? Right? God is making a distinction of all time in his scripture that he is the God of the nation of Israel and all the works that he's going to do through that nation. All these other nations that come, come from Abraham because he's the father of many nations, right? All these other nations are excluded. The Ishmaelites, for example, they are the ancestors of the Arabs of today. And they will try to tell you today that their Allah is our God the Father. And your response needs to be, actually, God refuted that in the Old Testament before Muhammad was even born. When he said he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he was talking specifically about that lineage leading to the Jewish people, leading to the Messiah. You know, he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, right? Because he changed his name to Israel. Excluding Ishmael and the Muslims of today, he is not their God. And then you make sure to tell them, but Christ has given you a way to the Father, a way of salvation. I love telling Muslims, John 14, 6, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that's a bold claim. Jesus is saying you're going to hell unless you go through him. So you better investigate everything he is saying in the New Testament with a sincere heart. And just one last thing on this rabbit trail. Real quick, I want to just prove Islam in 60 seconds. Muslims believe all our prophets in the Old Testament and Jesus of the New Testament were sent by God. They believe they were sent by Allah, right? But they believe since they contradict the Quran that the message in them was corrupted by Satan. And yet they also say God's word in the Quran cannot be corrupted. So according to them, Satan had the power to corrupt God's word once in the Old Testament, and then he had the power to corrupt God's word a second time in the New Testament. But Satan can't corrupt God's word a third time because Muhammad said so. There, you can't place your faith in that. That is a terrible claim. And they have no way around that. They, they, they'll try to... When they try to argue against that, when I, when I bring it up, because I've talked to Muslims and brought that up, they have no, it falls apart. Every argument they can, every counter argument falls apart against that. But anyways, let's continue. God says in Exodus 3, um, Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, Now come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. God tells him that he will be with Moses. Moses says, what if they don't believe me? So God tells him to throw down his staff, and it becomes a snake, and tells Moses to pick it up, and when he does, it becomes a staff again. It's a pretty cool trick. It's a, a real trick, but it's a pretty cool one to help give him faith. Jews tend to need to see signs. God then has Moses put his hand beneath his clothes, and when he pulls it out, it's leprous. It's sick with leprosy. And if you guys know what leprosy is, it's basically like, if you think of a zombie movie, it's rotting flesh. It makes your flesh rot, and your fingers will fall off, your nose will fall off. It's 
So he puts his hand back in his clothes, pulls it out, and it's fully restored. But even with these signs that Moses has now, in chapter 4, verse 10, then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. For I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. This is why some scholars believe Moses may have had a stutter or some type of speech impediment. Um, but it's also possible that he, he just had the, the psyche of someone that, in confrontation, he just shuts down. Because there's plenty of people like that, too, where they can have all the arguments, know what they want to say, and then when they're in front of that person, it just it's all lost. It's like it all fell out of their head, you know. But the Lord said to him, Who has made the human mouth? Or who makes anyone unable to speak, or deaf, or able to see, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I myself will be with your mouth, and instruct you in what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. God's provided Moses with the signs to show. Moses says he's not a good talker, and God says he will handle that. And Moses still says, please send somebody else. <clears throat> Likewise, how many of you pray, God, please use me for your glory. God, allow me to further your kingdom. And then when he comes to use you, when you're in that conversation at work or with a stranger and the opportunity comes to point them towards Christ, and you say nothing, or you say in your heart, God, please send somebody else. No, it's not the right time for me. I'm not ready. You know, just think about this the next time God is tugging on your heart uh, to witness to people. We should all be witnessing in some form or fashion. So this behavior of Moses angers God, but he tells Moses he can use Aaron as his spokesperson. Chapter 4, verse 21 says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go so that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I am going to kill your son, your firstborn. I've had a lot of people, atheists especially, use this scripture to try and prove a point that God is unjust. They say on one hand, God is having Moses show signs to make Pharaoh let the Jews go. But on the other hand, he's hardening Pharaoh's heart so that he won't. Now there's multiple things at play here, multiple ways you can look at this topic. It's not as simple as God just hardening Pharaoh's heart against Pharaoh's will. Um, people that bring up this argument, they just simply they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So after this, Moses returns to Egypt with his wife and sons. He shows the Jews the signs that God had given him to perform. In Exodus uh, chapter 4, verse 31, it reads, So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed low and worshipped. When we're in the midst of our affliction and we see God is helping us through our trials, it's easy to worship him. And it was easy for the Jews to worship him there because they're seeing him. But if you don't see God working in the midst of your trials, are you still worshiping him then? Are you still trusting in him? We shouldn't need God to be easing our burdens in our lives in order for us to worship him. And we shouldn't need our lives to be going good um, and things to be okay in order for us to worship him. Just like in marriage, in sickness and in health, we should worship. So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and let him know what God told them. And this makes Pharaoh respond with, the Jews have too much time on their hands. They must have too much time on their hands. And so he makes the Egyptians give more labor to the Jews. He forces them to increase their labor. They have to basically make the same kind of bricks without the hay that they were getting, the, the resources that they were getting from the Egyptians. He's like, don't give them the resources, make them go collect the resources, and then they can begin their labor. So it's basically impossible for them to complete the task. Moses returns to the Lord and says, Why did you have me do this? Everything has become worse, and you haven't delivered us from the hand of Pharaoh. And the Lord responds with something interesting here. <clears throat> he says in verse 1 of chapter 6, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for under compulsion he will let them go, and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. 
here is where we see two things simultaneously going on. God is influencing Pharaoh to do what he wants. He's not mind-controlling Pharaoh, per se. Pharaoh's, Pharaoh is still doing things of his own free will, and yet it is exactly what God wants him to do. One, God is sovereign, and we know that. And two, the Pharaoh is accountable for his own actions. It's interesting how Scripture gives us insight on one of the ways God likes to operate within his creation with other people and when it comes to the topic of authority. It's, he doesn't just immediately take away from the authority that Pharaoh has. <clears throat> the Jews were slaves to Pharaoh. They belonged to Pharaoh. He had ownership of them. God isn't just going to take them back from him. Now he has the ability and power to do so if he wanted to, but he's choosing to make Pharaoh give them up of his own volition. He's basically saying, okay, I've made you the ruler of this land. What you say goes here, and you've decreed the Jewish people in your land to be your slaves. You've decreed that they're your property. So I'm not going to take them from you. I'm going to make you give them up. You could say I'm just speculating with that, but I also see a similar thing with how God's operating on a worldwide scale with the ruler of this earth, the current ruler of this earth, Satan. 1 John 5.19, if we can get that on the screen, says, We know that we are of God, and that the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. God could just end everything now, throw Satan into the lake of fire, redeem those he's go who's going to redeem, but he's not doing it that way. He allows everything to play out for his glory, for his glorification, but also for our development, for us to grow in character and experience this fallen world, gaining wisdom we could never receive otherwise. So God hasn't fully taken away the dominion and authority over the world that Satan has yet. It's not going to be taken away until Satan violates the authority he has by trying to invade God's holy land and trying to wipe out the Jews during the tribulation. And just a, a thought, an interesting thing when you, when you think of the character of God and how he operates in relation to to authority. And we know all authority is given from God to the rulers of this world. <clears throat> so, in chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, it reads, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And this is where he tells us why. So that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my armies my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt, by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. God is revealing himself to the Egyptians here. No matter what they've been taught with their gods that they worshipped in ancient Egypt, no matter what decrees Pharaoh said or what he claimed himself to be, part of the reason why God is hardening Pharaoh's heart so that he can let his glory be known to the Gentile Egyptian people. In chapter 7, verse 10, it reads, So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also had the magicians of Egypt do the same thing with their secret arts. And God's staff swallows up all the other staffs. But this doesn't faze Pharaoh. Another, another thing to note here is the, the power of the witchcraft that was going on was very real. And it's a very real thing today that you do not want to mess with. Or if you know people that, that say they're into witchcraft or things like that, it's not just fun and games. It's a portal. It's a demonic portal. And some of those things are very real. They, there is... A, an evil power behind it, it's not even, it doesn't compare to the infinite power of God. But it's just something you, you need to witness to those people if you know someone like that. And don't think it's just fun and games, you know. <clears throat> but it's here we end up coming to the ten plagues of Egypt. And we're going to go through each one here because God is humiliating the Egyptian gods with each plague. It's not just about convincing Pharaoh to give up the Jews. There's more at play here. It's showing all the gods that they worship in Egypt 
showing their inferiority. He's demonstrating, God's demonstrating his superiority over them. And we know this because it says so in Exodus 12.12. 12. Also back in Exodus 5.2, it reads, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Well, he's definitely about to find out who the Lord is. The first plague, God turns the water of the Nile River into blood. The Nile River was their source of life for them. It was their greatest natural resource. Their whole culture is built around it. Their god Osiris was over the Nile, so God demonstrated his superiority over Osiris. Um, and every, all these plagues are in relation to a god. It's, it's really interesting. But, and when we get to chapter 8, uh, the second plague, frogs cover the land. We're talking everywhere. They get into the people's houses and their bedrooms, get into their beds. They're jumping all over them. They're getting into their ovens, into their pottery. It wouldn't be so bad if you, you know, you're just killing them off as they're coming. But in their culture, their goddess Heket of Egypt embodied a frog. So they were holy, just like Hindus today. They can't kill cows. They're starving in India. But, and there's cows walking around, but they can't kill them and eat them. It's the same thing with, the, with Egypt back then. And these frogs are everywhere. They can't kill them because they're holy. And so you know, God's having a little fun with this. The third plague is dust becoming lice, and their god Geb, I don't know, and I'm probably also pronouncing their, their god's names wrong, but that doesn't matter anyway. Uh, Geb was their earth god, and it was a judgment on him. The fourth plague, a swarm of flies, and it was a judgment on their god Kephri. The fifth plague was the death of cattle and livestock. This was a judgment on their god Hathor, or Apis the bull. Or Menevus in Greek culture was the name. Some of these, they had multiple gods for the same thing. <clears throat> Six ashes turned boil, to boils and sores. The Egyptian priests would throw ashes in the air as a means of blessing people. Now their blessings became a curse. This was a judgment on, Os on Isis. God is completely destroying their entire religious system. All the gods are being completely humiliated and shown to be nothing. And while that's happening, what is this saying about Pharaoh, who himself believes you know, he's a god? <clears throat> the seventh plague was hail in the form of fire falling from the sky, a judgment on their sky goddess, Nut. The eighth plague was locusts coming, eating everything that was left behind from the previous plagues. All the, the little that they had left, now that's gone. And there were so many, you couldn't even see the surface of the land. There were that many locusts. It was a judgment upon their god, Seth. The ninth plague was three days of complete darkness. And that was a judgment upon their god, Ra and Amen. And through all these plagues, Pharaoh would say they could leave or make sacrifices to their gods if they made the plague stop. But once the plague stopped, Pharaoh would go back on his word and his heart would harden again. Then we come to the tenth plague, and it's the final plague. And we're going to wrap up at, after this plague because it embodies a lot. It was the death of the firstborn. <laughs> Thus, it was a judgment upon Pharaoh. Let's read Exodus 11.1. 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, One more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. Okay, and there's going to be a lot of symbology and foreshadowing here, and it all points to Christ's sacrifice in the New Testament. Every, like The Old Testament, that's why we have such confidence, because the Old Testament predating the New, and it's all pointing towards Christ. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to the father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, in proportion to what each one should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. 
you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day at the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to slaughter it at twilight. Excuse me. So an unblemished lamb is to be slaughtered. Exodus 12, 7. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. Exodus 12, 13. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Think of the picture here. They are putting blood on the two sides of the doorpost and the top. What is the shape that is symbolically blocking that doorway and preventing the destroyer from coming in? You know, the two doorposts and the top, right? With a thorn of crowns and pierced hands, you see this points to Christ as the perfect lamb being sacrificed and saving us from death. <laughs> Blocking those doorways from the destroyer. We read in Exodus 12.23, wasn't just it wasn't just the Lord, there was um, a being there called the destroyer. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come in to your houses to strike you. This is a, as on a side note, this is a very powerful being. In one, in one night, wiping out a whole nation's firstborn and animals too. That is, you don't want to mess with God. And that's just a being he created underneath him. There's only one thing that protects them on that night. It's not that their ethnicity, not that they were Jews. It's the blood of the lamb protecting them from the destroyer. And this is why we call it the Passover. This is why they call it the Passover. Because the destroyer, because the Lord, passed over their houses. And did not, uh, they weren't harmed. Their firstborn were not harmed. So Exodus chapter 12, 30. We're going to close with this scripture. And Pharaoh got up in the night, and he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go, and bless me also. So we're going we're gonna to stop there. I wanted to get further, but there's just so much, you know, and Exodus gets even more in depth than, um, with Moses than Genesis does with the patriarchs. Do we have any questions?